Hello, everyone. I'm Alan Kozen, and welcome to a show we call Things We Said Today, where we talk about all things Beatles and Beatle-related. Uh, joining me are my regular co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you may also know from his own radio show, Every Little Thing, uh, Steve Marinucci, who you will know from his columns as the Beatles examiner and the examiner of all kinds of other things, and the author of Meet a Monkey, Davy Jones, Al Sussman, um, who writes for Beatle Fan and is the author of Changing Times, 101 Days That Shaped a Generation. And joining us is our regular guest, Darren DeVivo from radio station WFUV in New York. And today we're going to be talking about John Lennon's mind games. Um, no particular reason, just seemed like a nice time to revisit mind games. Um, so, Let's start with Ken. Presumably, we've all listened to it this week. What what, what was it like uh, returning to it for you? Well, I, I'm never returning to it. It's always in my mind anyway, because uh, most of the, the Beatles and solo Beatle music I listen to on a regular basis. And the fact that I do a radio show where I mix all the music together, I'm constantly hearing the songs from the solo albums anyway. But Mind Games is an album that I've often thought of as being the most underrated of all of John Lennon's solo albums for the simple reason that um, I think every single song on the album is strong. The songs go from good to great. And, um, you know, it's one of those albums. I'm kind of one of those people that every time an album is overlooked or, or hasn't been given the credit that it deserves, I kind of, uh, I, I kind of try to push that album more into the fore and uh, I, I like to give that album more exposure and, and praise it more. And I think that in John's solo career, you know, people point to the Plastic Ono Band album and Imagine as being, you know, amongst his best. And even in John's own words, he said that and he even said that uh, Double Fantasy was the next great album or very good album that he released. But I think uh, the music in between... Uh, imagine and double fantasy doesn't get nearly enough credit and the mind games album every single song i really like and uh that's probably the one thing the overriding factor about this album i love every single song on it and there are very few songs in john solo career that i don't care for but you know every song on this album like i said it goes from good to to very strong and it's got some of the best songs from his solo career like Out the Blue, which I think is one of the greatest of his love songs. Mm -hmm. um, the, title, the title track itself, I think, is a masterpiece. It's not only a great song, but it's, it was so well produced. And almost, the funny thing about that song that I, that I think about is that this was the first album that John uh, worked on that Phil Spector was removed as a producer. And yet, Mind Games, the song, kind of has a Phil Spector feel to it <laughs> mm -hmm. you know it, it kind of has that kind of production it's it's more layered and uh i do love the whole sound of that particular song but we'll go deeper into all the songs here but there there's so many great songs and i really mean great on this album i assume ascent is one of my favorites of john solo career mm -hmm. i know i know is one of my favorites you are here you know in terms of melodies in terms of lyrics I think it's extremely overlooked and uh, a lot of gems throughout this album that I think people should uh, should try to uh, appreciate or if they haven't listened to try to uh, just investigate that album because uh, John himself certainly when he looked back at this period mainly when he was away from Yoko when he had a, a problem with the relationship and he was with May Pang he kind he kind of um, you know wrote that off that whole period. But between Mind Games and Walls and Bridges, especially, there's so much great music that came out of those two albums. And Mind Games isn't given as much attention as Walls and Bridges did. Walls and Bridges was much more of a commercially accepted album, was a number one album. And Mind Games is kind of forgotten. And the only song that most people would know is the title track. But um, all the other songs are worth listening to and appreciating. But I would definitely say that this is... You know, it's it's my personal favorite of John solo albums, partly due to the fact that it's overlooked and it doesn't get played out like certain songs like Imagine, which is a great song. Don't get me wrong. But I tend to like to um, 
give credit to the albums that normally you know people pass by and and don't give nearly enough credit to and mm-hmm. definitely the most overlooked in John's solo career is Mind Games. Mm. Well, probably the most overlooked track is Utopia National Anthem, which of course. incredibly well refined some of the ideas that you worked on in <laughs> Two Minutes Silence on the great, <laughs> great Life with the Lions. There we go. Got that in early this well, time. Yeah, yeah, I, I was actually thinking about that. I, I, I knew there was going to be a correlation there, so there we go. Uh, but he tried to make it a more commercial track than Two Minutes of Silence. He wanted it to be more concise. Right. So that's right. why we have Utopia National Anthem. We could, do a whole we could do a whole show on that. <laughs> you know, the thing is that the Utopia National Anthem is always playing somewhere. Right. <laughs> so, Darren, you want to um, step in next? Wasn't uh, the Utopian uh, International Anthem released as a single in, uh, in N- Nepal, I think? Um, <laughs> ha, 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 ha. Hmm, there now there is a pressing I have to get. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I I agree a lot with what Ken said about mind games, uh, and I'm I find it uh, you know I've wondered this to myself why that particular album, and maybe to a lesser extent, or maybe just as much walls and bridges tend to fall through the cracks. Uh, I think because Lennon has made so much timeless music and important music, some of it is bound to fall through the cracks. And unfortunately, Mind Games, with only one hit and one song that was heavily played on the radio, was a candidate to be an album that would fall through the cracks as time would go by. A Best of Collection comes out, and for a while there, it seemed like every other year there was a new John Lennon Best of Collection coming out. You'd get one or two or three songs from Imagine or Plastic Ono Band, but not Mind Games. And I think in time, that perhaps helped the Mind Games album be one of the ones to kind of be forgotten. But I agree with Ken. It is, uh, to me, it's always been because it was not, has not been held to the the heights that Imagine has held. To me, Mind Games is like a poor man's Imagine. Uh, It has (laughs) in very, it's very similar musically. In the way the album is structured, he's still writing personal songs. He's not afraid to share a little bit of his political view, but it's sugar-coated, which was intentional on Imagine. You know, it's more commercially palatable. Uh, I would actually say you could make the argument that pound for pound, Mind Games might be better than Imagine, but it doesn't have the heavy hitters like Imagine and Jealous Guy on it. That may, you know, that most people will gravitate towards my personal favorite of Lennon's my kind of if we were doing a show about the albums that tend to get overlooked. My personal favorite's always been Walls and Bridges with Mind Games kind of right behind it. And one of my favorite John Lennon songs of all time is Meat City, uh, just because it's an off the wall rocker. When I was eight, I was eight when the album came out. And loved Mind Games, the song. And I had the single. I didn't own the album until years later. But I loved the flip side, Meat City. To this day, I don't quite understand what the song's all about. But the little <laughs> the little <laughs> backwards uh, sound effects in there now, years later, I know the kind of game that John was playing with those uh, noises, those backwards sound effects. I just love that stuff. And... Um, more times than not, if you're in the car with me and i am got the Lennon CDs handy, I'm usually grabbing for mind games before Imagine and maybe even Plastic Ono Band, only because Plastic Ono Band is not the kind of album you put on, you know, uh, to sit back and, you know, relax and sing a couple of tunes mm. off key, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, so <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's nice to see mind games getting attention in this show and uh it's unfortunate that as the years have gone by uh it has sort of become a forgotten album but as i mentioned up top probably because you know it didn't have imagine or uh a jealous guy to call attention to it Mm -hmm. those are all good points it's funny though you know jealous guy uh, is 
if you're looking for a, a, a beautiful ballad, um, it certainly this certainly has several of them. Um, mm-hmm. You know, um, you are he- you are here is another beauty too. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And one day at a time, out of the blue. I mean, there's yeah. there's there's so much great stuff on here. Um, Steve, do you have a contrarian view tonight? <laughs> <laughs> You say that what? like you're expecting one. Yeah, yeah, yeah I do. <laughs> I'm getting, I'm getting a billing here. Um, well, uh, now I'm almost afraid to say what I was going to say. I have to say that, you know, my favorite solo, uh, Lennon solo album is uh, Plastic Ono. Uh, always will be because I remember wearing that sucker out, uh, wearing the vinyl out on that thing from Planet so much. I, I am going to be contrarian a little bit. I don't, I, I don't think it's. The most forgotten album, I think, uh, Walls and Bridges is a little more forgotten than this one. I was struck; it, it had been a while since I listened to it to uh, Mind Games, and I was struck at how cohesive this album is. It's incredibly cohesive. I, you know, it's yeah. I mean, everything just kind of fits together very nicely. I actually listened to the. I'm not sure what year this reissue was. It had the um, the uh, extra tracks on it. The uh, mm-hmm. 2002. Oh, yeah. yeah, home demos, and that, those were interesting too. But really, I mean, the 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 part of the uh, the I mean, the album, the basic album is is great. Um, you mentioned uh, one day at a time really struck me. I, yeah, I kept thinking of Number Nine Dream when I was sitting there listening to that, and I was actually out walking and listened to, listening to uh, Bring on the Lucy, um, and that really kind of boosted my walk a little bit. Mind Games is a, is a classic. I think it's one of the you know, it's one of his best songs ever. Um, I agree with the with the with the comment about the Spectre uh, sound. There's definitely that there. there. I mean, there's just there's just so many songs here that are that are really good. And it you know, if it's been forgotten, that's a shame because it is a very cohesive album. There's not there's no uh, there's no real uh, drop off uh, at any point in this album. It's really good. Okay, Al. I think uh, basically I'm sort of bouncing off what everybody else is saying. Uh, For me, Mind Games is the most consistently satisfying album of John's entire post-Beatles career. Uh, Because it seemed that with the other albums, there was, you know, that Plastic Ono band was maybe a little too bare wires for the kind of the average audience. And while uh, there was, um, you know, Imagine had a, a good deal more polish to it than Plastic Ono Band, still there were things like I Don't Want to Be a Soldier Mama that maybe, you know, kind of the average audience member might not be all that well thrilled about. Obviously, uh, uh, sometimes New York City is not for everybody. Mm. Walls and Bridges, uh, certain tracks on it are maybe a little too given where John was in his in his personal life at that point. Uh, there are some tracks on there that might be a little too a little too dark for for some. Some people may not have liked the rearrangements of some of the oldies on rock and roll, and mm. of course there are people that you know did not appreciate the half Yoko, half John format of Double Fantasy and then subsequently Milk and Honey. So really this album is kind of the one that's, I would say, the most satisfying to not only to me, but to, I'd say, the overall audience. Because not only are there some absolutely lovely songs on it, some of the uh, the most beautiful ballads, of John's entire career, Beatle or non-Beatle, mm. but also some uh, some kick-ass rock and roll, tight as, um, even a you know little bit of a uh, little bit of the politics of sometime in New York City and uh, bring on the Lucy, uh, and uh, just you know just very commercial, very hook-filled, very accessible songs. I don't think there's a track on here which really could be called you know uh, well it's just for certain tastes i'd say it's just overall it's the most consistently satisfying of of all of john's uh, post beatles albums 
Mm-hmm. Okay, that leaves me. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's funny. I didn't think of it really as John's most neglected album. I, I think that the case that um, that Ken and, and Darren made that it might be um, makes a lot of sense now that I hear it. But, you know, I, we all tend to think of a lot of these albums in terms of our own initial responses to them. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, mine, you know, I was in high school when Classic Ono and Imagine came out. And I just thought John was, you know, the king of the universe in those days. I was extremely disappointed by some time in New York City. It it just seemed, it really seemed to be half-baked and Mm. not well thought through and not well done. And, you know, I I, I just, uh, I, I, I didn't even know how to deal with how disappointed I was, mm-hmm. um, but just sort of started listening to other things because, you know, I thought, okay, you know, maybe he's just totally lost it. So when Mind Games came out, it was like, okay, okay, he's back. Um, so I've, I've always thought of Mind Games as something that kind of broke that little slump. I'm not totally sure, you know, nowadays when I listen to Sometime in New York City, I dislike it as much as, as I did when it came out. But but Mind Games was really, uh, you know, okay, he still can write a great song, a mm. lot of great songs, and um, produce a, a really well-made album. So I've always thought of it that way, you know, not as, as neglected, um, because I hadn't really considered its its place in the sort of general world outside me but um you know uh, that said i mean it, it's been some time since i've listened to it sometimes you put these things on and they're they're just on and you do other things but um over the weekend i i gave it a close listen and um and almost as if it was new um you realize of course there are actually two mind games out there um, the 2002 version with the bonus tracks is actually a remix. Mm. Um, and a lot of people, you know, I don't know, I, I didn't get to really compare them side by side. Um, but I know that a lot of people were a little upset at the remixes of the early 2000s because it's, you know, OK, these are sacrosanct tapes. Why is Yoko doing this? The tracks that I did compare, the 2010 remasters in the signature box and then available separately, went back to the original mixes. And, you know, maybe it makes sense to have both of them available, as a lot of us do. Um, The the tracks that I did compare, um, I found that the 2002 remix actually had a little bit more punch and... The placements on the few tracks I was able to listen to side by side seemed pretty much the same to me. I mean, I didn't hear any radical transgressions going on there, so I'm not sure entirely what people are upset about. Perhaps they can write in to us on Facebook and and remind us. But so I, I listened actually to the 2002 version because um, I wanted to hear the bonus tracks as well. And I just love it. We... we We already talked about a few of the tracks one day at a time. Um, Listening to it again closely uh, just reminded me of what a a great song that is. I mean, it's uh, uh, some of the some of the lines in there. You know, you're the apple and I'm the tree. You're the door and uh, you're the door and I'm the key. Or is it I'm the door and you're the key? Uh, (laughs) You're the you're the honey and I'm the bee. A lot of those things, I mean, they seem like very simple lines, but to get a whole bunch of them into one basically love song with that kind of imagery is is really an achievement. I wasn't as crazy about Tight As and Bring On The Lucy and Even Meet City. I, I, I kind mm. of liked them, but, but I was more attracted, at least on this listen, to the slower ballads. Um, mm. I thought that I, I really liked his melodic sense and the, uh, the care that he had brought to the lyrics. And I thought, you know, as, you know, as I think a lot of us often think when we listen to that side of John, you know, why is it that Paul is always regarded as the great ballad writer and John mm. isn't? But, you know, listen to these things. These are great songs. You know, and the rockers did. I mean, I had to admit, you know, 
Meat City and and Tide As, uh, even if I didn't like them as much as the others, they they really did have a lot of energy and uh, and there is that side of him that I've always liked as well. So it, it may have been just hearing it this weekend for some reason I, I was more attracted to the other stuff. Um, so that was that was my experience of it. Can I jump um, in about something with with in regards to the CD reissues? Mm-hmm, absolutely. Uh, of of not only mind games but of uh, Lennon's catalog as a whole, I don't recall. Actually, I don't think I own Mind Games on vinyl. Uh, so for a long, long time, I heard it on the original CDs. Mm-hmm. And John's production was so influenced by Phil Spector. Uh, you can hear how John grew up and loved that big echoey wall of sound thing that Spectre did. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and, and as a result of that, Spectre's gone by the time Walls and Bridges comes around. I'm sorry, by the time Mind Games comes around. But it still sounds as though he's in the room next door, Mm -hmm. Phil Spectre. Mm -hmm. Same, maybe slightly to a lesser extent, uh, Walls and Bridges. But you could tell how Spectre had an influence on the way John liked the records to sound. He also liked to mess around with his vocal, hit it with a lot of echo, mm-hmm. um, bury it a little in the mix even. So the original CD of Mind Games was really what I heard a lot over the years. Um, and those original CDs all tend to be a little inferior sound-wise. Right. And they could mm-hmm. they could make John's production style sound muddy and sloppy even Mm -hmm. so when the yoko remasters come out in 2002 it cleaned mind games up considerably and at first it was a revelation to me but then i thought you know i sort of miss the murk that i was used (laughs) to hearing um (laughs) but if you listen to what yoko did with those reissues that if memory serves correct started in the year 2000, I think, with Imagine, I mm-hmm. think. I think so. Mm-hmm. Imagine was faithful to the original. With each series of reissues, Yoko started to take more and more liberties with the packaging and how far she would go in actually remixing the albums. Mm-hmm. Mind Games, to me, I think is in the middle of that reissue program. By the time Yoko redoes Walls and Bridges and sometime in New York City, she has taken uh, a lot of liberties uh, with the sound quality, uh, the way the mix is done, even tinkered with it. And, of course, we know how, in the case of Walls and Bridges, she seriously messed around with the artwork and mm-hmm. uh, and cut sometime in New York City down to a, a yeah. more palatable single disc. When right. the reissues came out in 2010, they went back to, uh, you know, the John original mixes. And that was, to me, perfect. Yeah. Because it right. had some, mm-hmm. it, it cleaned up that murk of those original old discs, but gave me the way John wanted these things to sound. And yeah. for me, the 2010 and currently available edition of Mind Games album is the one to listen to, and that goes for all the others. And that kind mm-hmm. of ramshackle charm Mind Games had is, again, available and, and now can be heard in its full glory because it's that ramshackle kind of sound that I kind of loved about the Rock and Roll album mm-hmm. and Walls and Bridges and Mind Games. Uh, he kind of made that you know, Phil Spector thing, his own. So mind games, Yoko's mix cleaned it up a little too much. I thought, and removed some of the charm. But, uh, if, uh, if any of that made sense, the 2010 edition is the home run for me. Yeah. That was the one that I listened to over the weekend as well. And Hopefully it, that made sense. What I just said, cause yeah. I confused no, it did. myself <laughs> a little. It, no. it did. You know, like you say, the, the early CD, was really not very good and that was the case for a lot of the early Beatles yes. solo CDs those things were just yeah. sort of put out mastered from what sounded like you know an eighth generation <laughs> submaster with lots of hiss i remember the first time um the first time all things must pass came out 
Oh, there was a big was volume drop in yes. the middle of one of the oh, songs. Yeah. I, I mean, they were just a disaster. Um, and, you know, and, and for those of us who are serious about this, it means that, I mean, I, how many times have I bought mind games? How many times have I bought each one of these? Because you would hear that the British pressing is better, doesn't have <laughs> right. some of these problems. Right. And so you'd get it and maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. And then Yoko put out her remixes and then the 2010 one. So, um, yeah, I think uh, not to, if you don't even count the vinyl purchases, uh, we've probably bought all these albums five or six times each. Mm -hmm. um but they are getting they are getting better as you say i think the 2010 is is the standard edition just because it was john's own mix but the 2002 i think in the case of mind games i don't think she tinkered all that much and i kind of like the sharpness of the drums and and vocals that are still a bit soft focus on the 2010 version that may sound contradictory mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> These are all great points. Uh, I will say that I like both the remixes and the 2010 remasters for different reasons. Mm -hmm. um, one thing, I like hearing slight variations in the mix. And I didn't hear too much of it in Mind Games in, in the remix. Although the title track, I heard a lot more keyboards mm -hmm. than on the original. Mm -hmm. But um, no, I enjoy when, when it's tinkered with a little bit. And um, the 2010 sound fantastic. But um, I would like to bring up a question, if I may. And I think a lot of it just has to do with um, the idea of having hit singles and how that affected the success of Mind Games and possibly how we look back at this album now. Because whereas with Imagine, the song was a big hit, number three hit in the United States, Mind Games only went top 20. Mm. It wasn't the huge hit that it really deserved to be. And perhaps for that reason, there wasn't a follow-up single, although there never was a follow-up single to Imagine either. But um, there's so many cases where there were solo Beatle albums where you had a big size hit as the first single and there never was a follow-up single. You know, like in the case of George Harrison with Give Me Love, which went to number one. And there never was a second single. And I think you know, that album suffered that because of that. Yeah. There's a lot of that that I've wondered for the four of them. Uh, why were there no singles off McCartney or Wildlife? Uh, why was there only one single off uh, Le Living in the Material World? Mind Games, uh, I'm, I'm not saying that they were going to be number one smashes, but there's candidates for a second and even third single off Mind Games. Um, right. And the other interesting thing is, if I'm not mistaken, Imagine was and even released as a single in the United Kingdom no. uh, initially. That's right. I think there weren't any singles off the Imagine album in the UK. Not, um, yeah, not until a decade later. Right. It was in the US that Capital uh, or Apple or whatever it was just you know chose it was a single. Mind Games maybe was hurt by the fact that uh, they didn't take a chance with a song like Out the Blue maybe. Uh, mm -hmm. maybe whoever made those decisions didn't feel like a Lennon ballad was going to, you know, be successful on the mm -hmm. charts. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, good point about bringing up the lack of a follow-up single, Ken, to uh, Mind Games, because it's something I've wondered myself. What's interesting about that is that the following year, Elton John took actually one of the songs from the album, mm -hmm. uh, One Day at a Time, and release that as the B-side of Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Right. And I'm trying to remember if, um, obviously we know that John is on Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. I'm trying to remember if uh, John was on that version, Elton's version of One Day at a Time. But the fact that it was, and that was at the moment when Elton was indisputably the biggest pop star in the world. And his records were at that point were were almost every single was an event at that point. So that was actually the fact that one day at a time was even a B side of an Elton single was actually a, a nice feather in the cap of uh, of the material from 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 Mind Games. Mm -hmm. Right. How many other covers are there of Mind Games songs? I can't think of that many. I mean that was a big one, the Elton one. But, yeah. Um, but but who else has done any of these songs? 
probably mm. just in like you know all those various you know local bands doing John Lennon tribute albums things like that but I don't remember for instance if there was um that Greenpeace benefit album that came out a few years back. Right. I don't remember if there were any songs from Mind Games on there. Oh. It was also that, I can... um, and I could look that up, but there was also that um, uh, double album that came out on, I think, Warner Brothers that was a, uh, I know R.E.M. did, uh, was the single, mm-hmm. uh, first single. Why am I I'm drawing a blank on that charity album, what the name of it was, and I'm wondering if was that an Am- Amnesty International? Uh, you know what? I think we're think we're talking Benefit. about the same album. <laughs> we are. Okay, yeah. yeah. That had that may have had a one or two on there because it yeah, was a double that's album. A, yeah, I don't have. Unfortunately, I don't have it in front of me. Actually, I do. Ah, okay. <laughs> I just ran to my CD library here. It's Instant Karma. Yes. Uh, the, the campaign to right. save Darfur. So let me just check here and see if there's any songs from Mind Games that are covered. No. No, there are no songs on that compilation from so Mind Games. So it's definitely neglected in that way. Mm-hmm. I mean, people aren't looking at, looking to it as a source of of material to, to cover, people who do covers. Yeah. That's kind of a shame because there's so much good stuff. I have a feeling that um, in John's case, a lot of the personalization of the songs may make it seem a little difficult for people to cover you know they seem they seem so much about you know john and what he's going through that it 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 seems almost beside the point to cover them and yet there are things from double fantasy and uh Mm -hmm. those are exactly the same so Mm -hmm. don't know what it is do you think that john writing off the whole period when he was away from yoko influenced the way that the public looks at that period the lost weekend period Oh, very much so Mm-hmm. Very much so, because of especially people who kind of uh, subscribe to the version of the story which comes from Yoko's camp, uh, they 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 do look on that period as as you know one where basically he was just hanging out in in Hollywood, getting drunk and getting in trouble and all the rest, mm-hmm. and it's May Pang who brings up the fact that during that period they recorded Mind Games and Walls and Bridges and Rock and Roll and produced Harry Nilsson's Pussycats and, you know, on and on. So that it was probably mm-hmm. the most fruitful period, creatively fruitful period of John's entire post-Beatles career. Mm. It's two ways of looking yeah, at yeah. it. Well, I was going to say that I, I think it's actually more of a stylistic thing, I think. You know, people tend to look at McCartney more, you know, as, you know, uh, for doing the songs and being able to do romantic. I mean, I don't think I think pe- people think of love songs, for example, uh, from McCartney and not from Lennon, even though they should. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's part of the problem. I think it's an image problem really more than anything else. Yeah, the unreconstructed mm-hmm. rock and roller. Right. Versus mm-hmm. the the pop craftsman. Mm-hmm. That kind of thing, and and, the, and it is so ironic because you have songs like "One Day at a Time" and "You Are Here" that are absolutely, you know, gorgeous, gorgeous ballads. And you've had people do, for example, take from the Beatles uh, canon uh, "In My Life." Yeah, there's some great, great, great versions of that song. Sure, and and you know, there's that's a, a good example right there mm-hmm. that it it could be done with London songs if people would take the time. But I think most people gravitate easily toward McCartney because mm-hmm. of who he is and his, in his image, you know, John has the had the harsher image. And I think that that hurts that a little bit, but it was just too bad. Well, you know, something I just wanted to bring up was the, this whole idea of the lost weekend period. And you think about LA, well, the mind games album was recorded in New York. Mm-hmm. It was recorded at the record plant in New York, so that was before that whole thing yeah, happened. That's true. But it yeah. was while while the relationship was unraveling yes. with with Yoko, so it was the start of that. But still, it shouldn't. I don't know if you should really group it together as part of the Lost Weekend thing. It was, yeah, well, I think I, of the Lost Weekend was, as starting a bit after Mind Games. Really, mm, yeah, yeah, that's fair. Mind Games was Thursday to the Lost Weekend. 
That's right. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. There we go. Very good. Uh, does, does anyone feel like the commercial fortunes of mind games might have been hurt by sometime in New York City coming before? Uh, and the, yeah, it no, couldn't, you know. It didn't help. And also the fact that uh, the right around the time Mind Games came out, Ringo's album, Ringo, came mm. out. Uh, and obviously, especially the fact that it was the only time that all four Beatles appeared on the same record post beat, you know, post group, I think that kind of overshadowed uh, Mind Games. Plus, as well, Band on the Run came out around yeah. the same time. Oh yeah, right. And and again, same same thing. It I think it kind of overshadowed Mind Games. Uh, obviously, it took a while for Band on the Run to really gain some momentum on its own. But I think the combination of those two albums um, somewhat overshadowed Mind Games. Does anyone? So you don't think that you don't think that the success of one would help the other? The success of the Ringo album. Maybe that would would help the Mind Games album instead it hurt it? Um, it seemed to overshadow it, you know, because of the fact that the, you know, the big story surrounding that album was the fact that all four Beatles were on it, something which had not happened since the breakup and it turned out mm. would never happen again. I think that was, you know, since that's the big story of the album and the fact that uh, the immediately Ringo had a major hit single from it in, in, in photograph. Mm -hmm. right. um, I think the, the combination of that um, and, um, and the, you know, the American, you know, McCartney and wings single of Helen wheels and all, I think all of that kind of combined to overshadow mind games to some extent. You know, even though you know, even though the single had done well, the single of Mind Games did very well. Uh, still, as as Ken pointed out, the the performance of the album was certainly not uh, up to the you know the that of Plastic Ono Band or Imagine, and certainly sometime in New York City did not help because there were probably a lot of people who were thinking, uh oh, this is gonna be another you know, another bunch of political songs and all and uh and never you know, never really approached it. Mm -hmm. Let me can I make a one more random mm -hmm. left field observation, ask the four of you. Uh I don't know how much this has how, how much artwork plays into the sale of an album or back in those days, a picture sleeve. Or, mm. I never f felt that the cover of Mind Games was the most attractive album cover. Uh, and, and you could disagree with me. You may, you may disagree with me. I wonder if the commercial fortunes of the album might have maybe weren't helped by the album cover. Mm -hmm. uh, Mind Games, John Lennon, very small print in the corner. You're walking by. Again, I was eight years old at the time when the album came out. I don't recall seeing the album in the stores, although I did have the 45 while it was right. on the charts. The most obvious feature of the album cover that jumps out at you is Yoko's face yes. in the form of a mountain. Yes. Uh, could there have been some people that walked by and thought, oh, it's a Yoko album and not and, and walked, you know, walked on or or Yoko's on this album, obviously. And after some time in New York City, I don't want to. You know, I don't want to uh, go through that again. I don't know if any of that played into some of the uh, uh, thinking of the consumer in 1973. Uh, having worked in retail at that very moment at Sam Goody, uh, you're right on the money. Yeah. Oh, wow. There okay. were absolutely people who uh, would, you know, would, would see it and say, think it was a Yoko album. Interesting. Okay. Because I always wondered yeah, right that. Was Even though the artist listed, I'm sorry. Good. No. Oh yeah, I mean it would be in the John Lennon bin, but then you know they would uh, they would see the picture of Yoko and immediately put it down, thinking that it was going to be another John and Yoko album, a la you know sometime in New York City or you know the avant garde albums. And I seem to recall a lot of pushback from that uh, sometime in New York City album. You know, oh, yeah. their image wise. 
back then. There was uh-huh. quite a bit. It took a in fact, it 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 took a long long time for that to die down because that album just really was a you know I mean it's I I mean I think we look at it all a little differently now, but mm-hmm. back then it it was not it was not appreciated by uh, by the general public. Matter of fact, Wally Pedrazic, uh takes a look kind of a revisionist look at some time in New York City in the um, on the the Beatle fan uh, blog something new a piece that popped about two weeks ago that's really interesting just, just give us a just just uh, I haven't seen that just give us a, a little bit of what he said well it, he basically it's kind of in a sense a revisionist um, uh, piece in that he he makes the point that the that the the, the really heavy politics of it uh, are now are kind of interesting, almost like as a curio of a particular piece of time. Although the one thing that uh, that I was in, in reading it that I was interested in uh, was the fact that he doesn't mention at any point in the piece Elephant's memory. And this, and I read it like the Monday mm. after the fest, <laughs> which was obviously, you know where Elvis memory was very much on our minds because of the fact that, you know, that Gary and Adam had been, uh, uh, had been there. And of course, uh, Ken and, uh, and Darren had, uh, had interviewed them. Uh, but no, there's no mention of Elvis memory at all, but it's, but it's an interesting piece as, as Wally's pieces always are, but it's, it is true that there was, especially at that time that, uh, sometime in New York City was reviled by a lot of, especially a, a lot of more hardcore Beatle fans who, you know, just didn't like the didn't like the political stance, or didn't like didn't like Yoko, or uh, various other things about it. And so some of that blowback may have um, may have very well have affected Vine Games, even though it was a year and a half later. Mm-hmm. I wonder yeah. whether um, Mind Games was a very conscious moving away from the uh, aesthetic. Of, I mean, both in terms of production and the fact that, you know, there's Bring on the Lucy, but otherwise not much political stuff. Um, no. Mind Games, it's so um, – he was working on that around the same time that um, Instant Karma came out. Um, there's actually – video taken by Tony Cox over a weekend in early February, I guess it was 70. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and it shows John actually working on mind games, um, I think on, on a guitar, sometimes on a piano. Um, and at the time, the lyrics were make love, not war, right. a little bit of right. a bit of which survives as, as the very, as the fade out of the song, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but he obviously revamped the whole concept, you know, just alluding to the original concept at the end. But it's 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 completely different. And apart from Bring on the Lucy, there's there's really not much political stuff in there. But I think, you know, it's possible that he he felt like, OK, I need to move away from this. This was a, a, a dismally unsuccessful mm. album last time. But I still have these feelings that I want to express and mm-hmm. bring on the Lucy, I guess, mm. is the is the, the place where he focused it all. Mm-hmm. He definitely wanted to move away from, you know, the, the political for the most part from sometime in New York City. I remember Gary Van Sock telling me several times that John was devastated at the lack of success of sometime in New York City. And also, apparently, the one-to-one concert was given fairly poor reviews yeah. the day after. Mm-hmm. And John, you know, I think John was baffled by this whole thing. Mm-hmm. So he not only dropped Elephant's memory, but he stopped associating himself with the political figures of that time. Yeah. He was also very affected by the fact that Richard Nixon won the re-election. Mm-hmm. So he was moving away from that whole thing, and he, he needed some time to recharge. And I think he probably was thinking he had to return to something closer to an Imagine-type album. So I think that's why you have the songs that you do have on Mind Games, with the exception of, like you said, Bring on the Lucy. Mm-hmm. And but, also, uh, by that point, also the immigration fight had really begun. Right. right. You know, because because of the fact that Nixon had been elected to the second term 
and uh, you know the 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 effort to get John out of the country really kind of went into high gear at that point. Perhaps uh, Mind Games was uh, Lennon's reaction to some time in New York City in a similar way that, from what I've read, John's reaction uh, or how Imagine was a reaction to uh, Plastic Ono Band. Mm-hmm. Uh, Plastic Ono Band was such a, a bare bones, tough, mm-hmm. non radio record. Yes. John thought, mm. Mm, okay, I got it now. If I put some sugar on all of this and mm-hmm. sweeten it up a bit, yep. uh, and then the result is Imagine. Then he goes and does a raw rock and roll political album like Sometime in New York City, and he goes, ah, okay, I'm going to have to sweeten the pot again <laughs> for my next effort. And the result is, again, a sh- more sugar-coated album in Mind Games. I guess, I mm-hmm. guess that blow, blows the theory that I had that John was pretty much a non-commercial guy because from what Ken said and from what, what you just said, Darren – you know, obviously that's not true because I, I somehow find that John being that commercially, you know, motivated to be somewhat of a contradiction. Um, I would agree with you. I would. Well, think I think. That, I would think. Yeah, that I think John, John had those warring impulses in, in, uh-huh. in him. You yeah. know, commercial, non-commercial, love songs, rockers, uh-huh. you know that. Sorry, Darren. Uh-huh. Go ahead. No, that's all right, Alan. I was going to say I could see John being the kind of person that didn't care if. He- is if he had a number one hit or not, but then he's got Paul and George on either side of him uh-huh. uh, soaring up the charts and it's like uh-huh. maybe feel a little left out here and go, wait a minute. And, you know, he puts out Plastic Ono Band and it doesn't hit number one. It's right. a raw record. McCartney was a raw record. McCartney was a number one. It didn't have any singles. I did a raw album. I put a single out. My record didn't do that well. You know what? I, what do I have to do here uh, to, you know, play this game? Uh-huh. Uh, why don't I put some strings and put a ballad here and m- imagine uh, the result? And the same thing with mind games. All right, give them the strings and a couple of ballads, you know, and uh, m- mind games happens. Mm-hmm. Right. Oh yeah, he was and, he was very much and, a creature of the, uh, you know, of, of the you know the music business. You know, he knew he paid a lot more attention to the music business than I think he kind of let on, you know, and he was, he was also, mm-hmm. yeah. Also remember that while John didn't have the commercial success that Paul did, mm. uh, it's like the first album McCartney went to number one, like you said, Darren, but John had more of the, uh, creative, uh, the, um, the music press embraced him yes. early on more than they did Paul, yeah. who was looked upon right. as being the bad guy. Mm-hmm. That that part that you know that was responsible for breaking up the Beatles, especially after watching Let It Be. Mm-hmm. Right. It's interesting. Yeah, that there were the, there were periods there, especially like in the first half of the seventies, when it seemed like one Beatle would be considered cool and one wasn't uh, quite a bit, and it changed a great deal. You know, uh, in nineteen seventy, George was probably the most popular of the four, and yet by nineteen, you know, the end of seventy four with the Dark Horse tour, he was very much on the outs with uh, kind of the media and at least some of the uh, some of the public. And John had much the same type of up and down conventional wisdom um, turmoil, and and certainly Paul did. You know, it took Paul until really 73 and into 74 before he really kind of returned to the good graces, so to speak, of the uh, certainly of the, you know, the, the, the rock press and, and even, you know, some of the, you know, the, his, his constituency, if you will. Mm-hmm. It's kind of interesting to think, uh, do we really feel that the four Beatles were looking over each other's shoulders at every given moment? At every new release, were they that concerned? Were they competing with each other, or were they just really supporting each other? I think at that point they probably certainly were were competing with each other because that was also the period when there was the most dissension. You know, the po- all of the post breakup, sue you, sue you, blues, dissension. Yeah. How do you sleep? All that stuff, and so yeah. and the fact that even when they were together as a group, there was competition. Within yeah. within the group, certainly by that point in the early seventies, they were very very much competitors. 
Yeah, I think it was pretty clear from things John said over the years in interviews that he was always very conscious of what Paul was doing mm -hmm. um, and that also he and the others were very conscious of what Ringo was doing in the sense that they always wanted to lend a hand when they mm -hmm. could. Yeah. Um, um, not sure how everybody else felt about George's stuff. We know Ringo played on some of it, you know, early on, but there doesn't seem to be that kind of back and forth. George seems to have been really the odd man out, really not caring that much commercially uh, about what was going on putting out albums and, and actually in one case having one rejected by his record label because it wasn't commercial enough and responding by writing blood from a clone, mm. you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and also there was that whole, during that much of that period, there was a good deal. There was maybe even more personal intrigue between George and John than there mm -hmm. was even between Paul and, and John. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a good deal of bad blood there. Yeah. You know, so that may be part of why it seemed that Ringo was the, you know, the one kind of constant in um, along with, you know, his own kind of coterie of players, you know, the the Gary Wrights and Billy Preston's of the world um, that were, you know, more the a, the part of George's records than uh, than the other, you know, the other Beatles. You know, mm -hmm. it's a fascinating it's a fascinating angle to look at whether or not we feel that each of the four Beatles cared that much about their own success. Mm. Because it's, it's varying degrees, I think, with each one of them. Mm -hmm. And certainly in the case with John and George, they're probably the most complicated. Yes. Because I think in right. the case of George, George, I think, like, like Patty Boyd said to us, I think he was taken aback by the success of All Things Must Pass. I don't think he, he was expecting that at all. And yet I think he was very proud of the success of that album. And then he had the concert for Bangladesh and Living in the Material World was a number one album. He had, I think, at, by the time the mid-70s happened, he had enough success to satisfy his ego to the point where, you know, he would still continue to make new albums. And if they sold, fine. If they didn't, that's okay. He wasn't really in the business so much to, to be number one or to have top ten hits. I don't think it mattered as much to him because I felt that he, he, he felt that he proved himself. But John, John you never knew about because, you know, he'd make comments like, if you want to, go follow the rolling wings. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know? <laughs> and yet uh, I think that, um, you know, with Paul continuing to have success in Wings, and in 1980, he commented about coming up and the fact that he liked the song. Mm -hmm. And it was a number one hit that year. Maybe there was a little bit of jealousy there, you know, and maybe that spurred him on a little bit to to go back into the studio mm -hmm. and to, to do some recording again. Yep. You know, it was also the right time after five years of being away. Right. But, um, you know, I think it mattered to John in, in some degree and in other ways it didn't. Mm hmm. And he was, you know, he was so complicated. You know, there were so many dimensions to John Lennon. I've always said that it was he was kind of almost like a like an onion, where you've got to peel away all of these layers, and 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 also the fact that uh, that he, you know, he could play fast and loose with, you know, his opinions, you know, where you know he might. Uh, say one thing just maybe even just for the shock value of how it would look in print and might uh you know two weeks later say something totally different mm -hmm. that's right and you didn't know you know what was what was the real his you know his real feeling it's true i know he he's he's one of the most complicated figures to figure Absolutely. out because like you said he changed his opinions as often as he changed his clothes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if you really, if you studied all the interviews that he did, you know, one moment he'll be dead set against the Beatles reunion. Mm -hmm. And then around 1974, he was kind of warming up to it a little bit. Mm -hmm. So he didn't really know how he felt. You know, he'll be attacking Paul McCartney in one interview. And then the next interview, he'll say he's, he's the best bass player or one of the best bass, bass players. You know, he'll give him some kind of praise mm -hmm. in, a, in another interview. So... He knocked the Rolling Stones in uh, in the um, well, the, the, certainly the Rolling Stone the, interview, you know, the the Lennon remembers interview, you know, mix a joke with his pardon the expression with his fag dancing, you know, <laughs> <laughs> quote unquote. But that, 
But, uh, you know, around, I think around 1974, he was saying, you know, people make fun of the Stones, but give them credit for weathering the storm. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. so it's just the same man saying two completely yeah. different things. Mm-hmm. So you never quite knew where he stood. Right. But every time he spoke, he spoke with such conviction that you believe what he was saying, but that's how he felt in the moment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, he's a very tough person to figure out. That's true. Very awesome. So, guys, our hour is cruising towards an end, and uh, I was wondering okay. if we wanted to, if if you each wanted to make some sort of a, a closing comment about the album. We've covered so much of it, but um, anything left unsaid that you had intended to get to? Uh, start with Darren. Um, the difference between the single mix of Meat City and the album mix, does anyone know the little backwards uh, messages that uh, John put in those two songs, in that song? No. Mm. Do you? Can you uh, tell the, us? The B-side version of Meat City, the, mm-hmm. with, well, the single version, which was the B-side to the song Mind Games, uh, the first, uh, it's been a long time since I played them backwards, uh, <laughs> and checked them out on tape, but the um, uh, one of the uh, little squeaky voices in the middle of Meat City John saying, or someone saying, check the album. And then when the, you listen to the album mix of Meat City, the backwards message, the little backwards voice sounds different. And when you play that back, it's, I won't say the word, but it's <laughs> F, F a pig is right. what it says, oh, wow. <laughs> which is pretty funny. Right. little uh, uh, subtle joke that John put in there on that song. I should actually um, take this opportunity to plug uh, Chip Mattinger's project that's coming up. Yes. Um, you know, for a lot of these kinds of details about the different mixes and what went into them and mm-hmm. what was going on with John at the time and the, and studio information, Chip Mattinger's Leninology is nearing completion. It should be out on October 9th, John's mm. birthday. And if you're into this kind of detail, that's going to be the place to look. Uh, so, Al, any and, and certainly comments? with with Chip's track record through the book Eight Arms to Hold You that he did with uh, mm-hmm. with Mark Easter, just on that record alone, uh, this should be this should be really really good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, no, I'd say nothing other than what I was saying before. Just that again, I would say that it's for me. It's this. It's the most commercially or not commercially, but it's the most consistently satisfying, at least for me as a, as a listener, it's the most consistently satisfying to me of all of John's post Beatles work. Mm -hmm. Steve. I was just uh, looking in a book called incidentally called every little thing by Mitch McGeary. Oh yeah, Mm. sure. Uh Um, And it mentions that there were, Different version uh, versions with different running times of, of uh, mind games mm-hmm. uh, issued. I mean, it sounds like there are only two seconds difference. Um, the, it says the original track was four ten, ten, then it was reissued on Shave Fish with with four twelve, even though the track ran four ten. And then on the John Lennon collection, it said it was listed at four twenty, but it was actually four twelve. So. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If okay. you listen to the fade, very, very last split second fade out mm. of uh, the song Mind Games, and I don't know where you'll find the differences, you can hear that uh, there was some sort of reverb, uh, percussion reverb that was removed on one of the CDs that you hear on the single. I forget, but there is some sort of slight tinkering done by somebody. Actually, I thought I heard a little bit on the, on the because I listened to the, the, uh, the 2002 CD, and I thought I heard a little bit at the beginning, not at the end. Yeah, could they, there could be something there too, like the beginning of uh, uh, Hold On John on Yoko's Plastic Ono Band mix, mm-hmm. as opposed to the original. The guitar intro is slightly different. Yeah, so no, however, I, however yeah, these I, things happen, you know. Right. Yeah, because I noticed when I was when I was listening to it through headphones, I could hear something at the beginning, and um, and then it went into the song. So. Yeah, but anyway, that's I. I mean, I don't have anything else to say, you know, other than what we've already said. So and Ken, well, a couple things. First of all, I believe it was Darren talking about this uh, about uh, whether or not 
the songs on Mind Games are represented elsewhere. And there was a great uh, compilation that came out, forget the year, it was about 10 years ago, uh, called Working Class Hero. Oh, yes. And it was a double CD. Yes. And, um, you know, for people who love the hits of John's solo career but want to go a little bit deeper Mm -hmm. and they don't want to buy all of his CDs, this is the perfect collection. Because apart from the hits... You go into certain select album cuts, and it's a good spread amongst all of his solo albums. Mm. And you do have, in addition to the title track to Mind Games, you do have um, Out the Blue on this collection. You do have Intuition on here, and you also have You Are Here on the collection. So it was not ignored on uh, Working Class Hero. I'm no. thinking of the, oh, you know what I'm thinking of is that there was a Working Class Hero tribute album. Yeah, right. it was done, oh. and actually, that's more than ten years ago. That's about twenty years ago now. Right, the album right. that had Mary Chapin Carpenter's version of uh, right. "Grow Old with Me." Ah, right. I'm thinking of something right. totally different. Never mind. I'm pretty <laughs> sure. I'm pretty sure that the working class hero, the definitive Lenin, which is the full title, yes, uh, right. is uh, the double anthology that that Ken is referring yeah. to. It's mm-hmm. the Yoko mixes, and it's out of print. Uh, you can't get okay. working class hero any longer, um, so you'd have to seek out a used copy or get it on eBay or something. Because I think when the 2010 uh, reissues came out, working class hero anthology was kind of phased out in favor of the power to the people uh, single disc best of. Mm, okay, which has uh, the John yeah. mixes anyway, right? The other thing I wanted to say was yeah, I've known Al now for well over 30 years, and I certainly didn't know that you felt this strongly about the Mind Games album oh, yeah. being so consistently strong. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm really pleased to hear you say that because um, it, it it has to be my favorite Lennon album, in part because I do feel it's overlooked. Mm-hmm. And I do recall that when the album came out, I don't remember radio playing anything other than the title track. No. And whereas other solo Beatle albums from 73 and 74, you heard album cuts on the radio besides the singles. I never re- remember hearing anything other than my I games. I think which, uh, that, you know, a Scott Muni, who was particularly a Lennon fan, file, whatever you want to right. call it, I think he right. did play things like One Day at a Time and maybe a couple okay. of others. But no, but uh, really, for, for the most part, it was just my games. Yeah, but if you take a look at this entire album, it is strong from start to finish. And I like the fact that you guys brought up the ballads here because, mm-hmm. John, you know, I really hate stereotypes. And like you said, John is known for being the rocker and Paul wrote the love songs. But actually, John could write just as great a love song as Paul and Paul could write just as great a rocker as John. And, uh, you know, certainly in on the Mind Games album, Out the Blue, I think, is one of the greatest love songs I think he's ever written. And um, I Know I Know is one of my favorites. You guys mentioned One Day at a Time. Really good stuff. I assume Ascent is actually a favorite of mine because it's such a good, powerful, bluesy number. And David Spinoza, who's one of the great studio guitarists, Mm -hmm. he did the lead guitar solo on on that song. And I remember going back to my days in New Jersey radio when I had him as a guest and he talked about that Mm -hmm. song. And that that guitar solo was was done in one take. Mm. And so, uh, you know, <laughs> the perfect guitar solo really made a difference in that song right there. Uh, I love it. And Intuition is a favorite of mine. I probably would have chosen that as a second single. It kind of had that circus atmosphere in the middle, which which reminded me a little bit of being for the benefit of Mr. Kite. That's mm-hmm. just what my, what my ears picked up anyway. Yeah. And You Are Here is gorgeous. Mm. Oh, God. The, the whole album is just wonderful. I Know I Know is, is a personal favorite of mine. Also because of the bass playing that's on that song, which really made a difference. Gordon Edwards was the bass player. He was gr- a great studio bass player. Mm-hmm. And uh, listen to what he adds to that song. It's very memorable. Mm-hmm. It's a very big part of that song, if yeah. you listen to I Know, I Know. Only People, uh, which I don't think any of us have brought up, which is a right. wonderful mm-hmm. song. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. By, by the way, so, working, working Class People is available through Amazon in the U.S. It's about to, You can get it... Um, there's a couple of um, importers that have it, um, and there's one uh, um, American uh, dealer that has it without the booklet. But for the for the for a complete copy with a booklet, it runs about twenty bucks. But you can get it if you still or if you're interested. Mm. Okay. Okay. So 
I guess that wraps it up for this week. Um, I thought it was a lot of fun revisiting that album. And now that we've discussed it all, I'm going to go listen to it again because, um, and, and not to mention the single of Meat City to hear the alternate backwards track. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, we will come up with another fascinating topic next time. And for. Ken Michaels, Al Sussman, Steve Marinucci, and Darren DeVivo. I'm Alan Cozen saying goodbye and good luck from Things We Said Today. Today.